First of all, wasn't Descendant just amazing? It was just extraordinary. My name is Dr. Jessica B. Harris, and some of you may know me from around the island, and some of you may know me from the Netflix docu-series, High on the Hog. <laughs> I am just so thrilled to be here, I can't tell you. I, I saw a screener, so I had a sneak preview uh, last night at about 10 p.m., so it was like, Oh my goodness, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. And I stayed up with all you know, kinds of things just running and running and running and running and running through my head while I was waiting. So uh, I'm not gonna share with you all of those because I'm hoping that we'll get people out so we can get started <laughs> with this conversation. Otherwise, you will be stuck with a monologue of me. <laughs> yes, you would. Oh, trust me, yes, you would. But while I am running through this, I'm going to kind of preempt one of my own questions, but the thing that really struck me so extraordinarily about the film was that Kajo Lewis lived long enough to be filmed. That to me was extraordinary because it told me, it reminded me, it kind of beat me about the head and shoulders with just how recent enslavement was. So let's not forget that. Let's not forget that as, as we look at this, as we see how this goes. Um, the other thing, are y'all coming out? Here we come. <laughs> Unfortunately, Amir Questlove had a flight. And we all know that if you're getting off this island, you gotta get off the rock when you can. <laughs> so he is not able to stay with us for the discussion, but we have all of these amazing people who have brought this together for us. So please give them a round of applause. <laughs> Our acclaimed director, whom you met earlier, who was hugged by my forever first lady, Margaret Brown, and next to her, producers Essie Chambers and Kyle Martin, co-producer Dr. Curran Jackson, and it's sort of proverbial to say last but not least, but in this case, I'm not even sure they're last, and they're certainly not least, direct descendants of the Clotilde, Vita Turnstall, and Joycelyn Davis. Thank you so much for being here with us. And you can see that y'all doing the Lord's work. So we are thrilled to have you here. I'm going to start with you, Margaret. Your documentary, The Order of Myths, centered on Mobile's segregated Mardi Gras. And it has a connection with this story. Can you tell us a little bit about that connection and if that influenced your interest in telling the story of Africatown? Yes, yeah, so I made a movie 15 years ago um, that Kern collaborated with me on um, called The Order of Myths, and it was about segregated Mardi Gras in Alabama, um, where I grew up. And the mayor, that year, the year um, 2007, um, Helen Mayer, um, who's a descendant of Timothy Mayer, was the white Mardi Gras queen. But the way it was talked about then was really differently. Um, people would say, oh, like, 
you know, it was like more of a whisper campaign about the Clotilda. And then um, after Mardi Gras was over, um, Stephanie Lucas, the black Mardi Gras queen, we were filming in her house with her grandparents and her grandfather, Barry Malone said, oh, like my family came over on the Clotilda. And I was doing sound and the cinematographer, we sort of just looked at each other because we did not know that. And um, the film kind of became sort of centered around that fact that Stephanie's family came over on the Mayer family ship that was brought here on a bet. Um, so yeah, so, you know, Kern and I sort of kept having these conversations. And then about four years ago, um, when Ben, who in the ship, in the film, claims he found the ship, um, he actually found the wrong ship first. And so <laughs> when he found the first ship that wasn't the Clotilda, we came down and started filming. And um, we, so we were there the day that it happened, when they did find the ship. Wow. Wow. So actually, you did a documentary where the queen of white Mardi Gras <laughs> was a mayor, and the queen of black Mardi Gras was a hotel descendant. Could you tell us just a tiny bit about that, and then we're going to get on to descendant. Well, I'm, it's very mobile, right? This business about people being connected. Um, you know, Queen Stephanie's people were owned, right, by uh, Queen Helen's people. And, you know, in Mobile doing Mardi Gras, in terms of partying and celebrating, ne never between shall meet. And so that was sort of an issue. And um, Margaret was perfectly positioned you know, proximity to see it and capture it. And so that's what happened. And tell the story. Thank you. Okay. On to descendant. And let's start with the descendants. Right, yeah. Jocelyn. Yes. What were your thoughts when Margaret came to you and said she wanted to tell this story? And what made you trust her? And so, why? When I first saw Margaret, she was filming one of our community meetings. And it was just something about her that kind of made me draw myself to her. And then also Dr. Jackson said, you know, I want you to meet Margaret. So it wasn't Margaret coming to put a microphone in my face. We developed a relationship before we started filming. So that made me trust her. And I trust my friends. You know, when someone says, I want you to meet this person, I trust her. I trust them as well. So that's how I looked at it. So we're really talking about a chain of trust? Yes. Yeah. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. Vita, at one point you say, I don't want to be a part of it. I want to be it. How or has Descendant allowed Africa Town to be it? Well, this is still developing but I do believe that this film has brought a lot of attention to Africatown. Um, we do have a seat at the table, but, you know, again, we have a seat at the table, but I want to be at the head seat. Uh, <laughs> we're getting there, but there's still a lot to do. You know, we're working on tourism and economic development, uh, but I still feel like they're the powers that be are still trying to drive, still trying to drive it. So we're trying to get a little more control. But the whole idea of not only a seat at the table, but maybe claiming the table as yours is a good idea. Um, <laughs> now we have this sort of triumvirate here, if I may do first names, Essie and Kyle and Kern. How did this happen? How did y'all decide and get together? It obviously is a community venture. How did y'all come together to make this and to form it? And... What y'all looking at me for? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, it wasn't, it was sort of organic, right? A bunch of creatives got together and decided that they had a good flow, right? And an ease uh, of communication and, um, and that's what happened. I, can I was just telling him on the way over here, I could see, still see him in that white t-shirt and that hat and them high top 
<laughs> tennis shoes, you know, on the phone constantly trying to find us additional funding, you know, and working hard to, to make sure that, that, that Margaret had enough stuff to, to shoot. And I can remember Essie being in the ear saying, this is appropriate, this ain't appropriate, do right to all of us. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's how it happened, you know, Margaret and I, we always teasing each other about you know, the film is an example of democracy with a, law, a small d in action, right? And this is when, like, form and cohort work, and creatively, at least. And so, in part, that's my answer. Did you... Okay. Had you worked together before the film came together? Had you worked individually or jointly on any number of projects? Y'all are right. All, any of the three of you? Kind of. Uh, I mean, I had worked with Margaret before, and Kern and Margaret worked together, and, and Margaret and Essie had developed a relationship uh, artistically, creatively. So they were not all of us together as a group, but, um, you know, there were, there, were, there were branches for yeah. sure. Yeah. Okay, so there was history. Yeah. Absolutely, yes. Okay, well, history seems to have worked in its favor this time. A uh, question, though. Um, there's so many layers of the film. And as we heard early, early on at the beginning of the evening that kind of blew us all out of the water, there were all kinds of other connections that might have even been sort of subcutaneous in the sense of, you mentioned Amir's connection. He signed on as executive producer, but tell us about his connection. Or, no? Um, Joycelyn? Yeah, Joycelyn, as cousin, maybe you should speak. <laughs> yeah, well, his connection, I mean, I just want to tell this story. When he did the segment with Dr. Henry Louis Gates, Finding Your Roots, um, someone at my church told me, and it was like, hey, have you seen the segment of Finding Your Roots with Quest Love? He's a descendant. I was like, okay, well, I'll watch it, you know, there's no telling who he's related to. And then when he sat across from Dr. Gates and they start naming all these people, I was like, whoa, wait a minute, that's my family, <laughs> right? Those are, that's my grandmother, my grandfather. So um, Amir is a direct descendant of Alule and Maggie Lewis, and those are the two survivors of the Clotilde, which are my family members. Okay, so Amir is your cousin? He is my cousin. There you go, okay. <laughs> well, how amazing, I mean, it's just, you know, Wheels within wheels within wheels. Mm -hmm. um, I have a, another question, it's not even on my list. As you were working with the videos, the VHS videos, <laughs> it occurred to me, are they digitized now? <laughs> Great question. Yeah, I got people, I call it hell for them showing the VHS, to, but that's what I keep in my office. The digitized versions are down at the genealogical library. All right. So they are digitized. Yeah. Right. All right. Does, doesn't that give you a heart attack every time you see him? I, yeah, well, I mean, I, 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 it was like, oh my lord. Oh, oh, wait, wait, wait. No, we, that can't be. That can't. So you just like to frighten us. Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. A little, a little trickster going on there. Okay. Very much so. Uh, very much so. All right. The church has said amen. Okay, um, Zora, Zora Neale Hurston is just so, oh, yay, yeah. all right. I mean, and Zora as anthropologist, which we really haven't thought very much about, but Zora as a student of Frank Boas, Zora doing all of the work in the South and in the Caribbean, the fact that you invoke and evoke the spirit of Zora Neale Hurston as very much part of the film. Right. Did you know from inception that she was gonna be a part of that? Because Barracoon was published in 2018. Is Mike Block here, the editor? You wanna stand up? The editor is here. The reason I bring him up right now is because um, 
we, it, it, I always, from the beginning, wanted Zora Neale Hurston to, it was, I could see it at the beginning, her words, she was very inspiring to me. Um, but yeah, when he, he, there was another editor before that, and I don't know that we'd worked that material. The first time we ever did a shoot, we did one of the, we did the scene um, with Emmett in the museum. And it was sort of always difficult to convince the funders that that fit in the story. Mm. They didn't see it like the way I could feel that I knew I wanted it to be a part of it. But working with Mike, we kind of figured out a way to, because it was just, it felt to me, it felt like we had to, it had to be woven okay. and it felt so appropriate. And in like, you know, one of those ways you can't really explain, but you know, I don't know if that's a good answer. That's a good answer, but we want to, go ahead, please. Oh, no, I was going to add to that. Um, um, it was very much the glue that we didn't know that we needed. I mean, you know, as you can see, this film could have been five, ten different films. Right. It was so complicated and complex. And I think by the time um, that Zora Neale was introduced, it's leaning into her as a story keeper, as a griot, yes. and making the connection between her and Dr. Jackson and Miss Lorna and, and, now, and now these guys. That, that was the poetry that we needed to connect all the, all the pieces. And she just brings it together. So, I mean, it's yeah. almost as though she's up there somewhere weaving yes. the tale, yes. yeah. you know. And the way you end the final credits over her singing. Right. It's just over her field work. Mike. Field work. That's, that's Mike's that was a Mike, Mike find. Yo, yo, Mike. <laughs> But with all of that, what happens? What happens next? Where do we go? Where do you go? Where, is, where would you want Descendant to take Africa Town? To take you individually and jointly as a community? What, what next? And that's for, well, anybody, but particularly Vita and Joycelyn. Dr. Well, first of all, I'm, I'm so thankful to the whole team for this film because it opened up a dialogue between my son and I. My son grew up with this, but didn't really realize it. My daughter also, but they, they didn't realize it. But after my son saw this film, he had so many questions. And I am so grateful that we were able to have that conversation. He's like, you know, what about the mayors? I mean, I know somebody named so-and-so and, -so and they might be related, but it just opened up a conversation. So I'm thankful that we're talking about it. I hope it inspires everybody out here to look into your own history, your own community. I, uh, I see it, we're getting a lot of attention from all over the world. I interviewed with a, um, a journalist from Germany. You know, they care all the way over there. But I'm hoping that all this attention will help to bring this community back to what it was. You know, it was a thriving community. And we want to bring that community back, but we want to bring it back our way. And for us, for it to be our community again. Jason? So the what next, um, Africatown is in need of several things that I can't list tonight. Um, one thing is redevelopment. So hopefully, you know, people can, when they see this film, their eyes are open to the environmental injustice, redevelopment, the blight, and all of those things above that we need. So um, that's what I'm hopeful for. And we've had this conversation about, you know, what's next. And I said that Clotilda and those captives, um, the state of Alabama, the people in Mobile, benefit off of those enslaved Africans. So now it's time for us to benefit from the Clotilda. So whatever she brings, whatever type of tourism, you know, all of those dollars need to come into the community. Because Africatown doesn't resemble Africa at all, right? No. So we need murals, performing art studios, and so many things that our community needs. So. That's a part of the what next, you know, what do we tackle first? You know, we have to, do we tackle the blight, the environment and justice, our schools? So it, it's several things to the what next. So, you know, we have a, several things 
to worry about. Okay. And this, thank you. As a folklorist, Dr. Jackson, where do you see, what do you see? Well, our friend, our friend Mary Elliott speaks eloquently about, she works for the National African American Museum. And what I see coming from the film is like, I don't know, where, it's like Sheila Flanagan says, I don't know who my ancestors are, right? I don't know who hopped the fence, right? <laughs> but these folks stand instead for the rest of us. See what I'm saying? Indeed. And so what I'm hoping is that other folks feel this sort of the, the resistance and the resiliency and the survival of it all, right? Um, you know, we were just talking on the way up here to, to, to Mother's Vineyard about the middle school needs to be saved. It's about to go away. It's going away because, well, you know, folks aren't really interested in sustaining black middle schools. And so the only thing that's keeping that middle school from going away is the descendants and the people of Africatown mm -hmm. being persistent and resilient. So that's one sort of practical thing. And then, um, yeah, I mean, shoot. Somebody's gotta, somebody's gotta earn, somebody's gotta benefit. And this is a, the perfect test case, as I said in the film, for, for reparations. When you end up in the national, well, let me get it right, NAMAC is the acronym, but the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture, mm -hmm. she says something to you. She gives you a challenge. She says you must think about what do you want now. And along with the reparations, if you had a list, and I'm saying reparations, not necessarily talking about a cash sum. Oh yeah, we understand. Which may be a cash sum too. But what would the list be? What, how do you see Africa Town 2042? A community like none other that you know, if I'm around, <laughs> you know, just like, wow. Like, there are people that have been fighting for years for this to come, right? So I would be in awe. I know it's gonna happen. You know, you know, we talk about the year. It's gonna happen. It's gonna happen sooner than later. Mm -hmm. That's what I, that, that's, that are, those are my hopes. Okay. Okay. I mean, I think the thing that struck me so much was, and Margaret, this is, well, all of you, this is your genius, how much Africa Town is microcosm of so many other African American neighborhoods. When I saw the cement factory, when I saw the highway overpass, it was like, mm, Robert Moses at work again. Um, you know, all of those things are all inherent in and boxed up in. How, how do you see you becoming really the beacon? And I guess that may be the answer and not the question, but how do you go about being the beacon and anybody? I think it's already beginning. I think this film, by it shining a light on this community, the other communities that look like it will watch us. And you know, we, we have a precedent to set. We are working hard. There has been work for a very long time going on, but now the light is shining on us. So I, I think people are just gonna watch. I mean, this, this is an activist community. I mean, it the, is. This, yes. And so I think just that this film will amplify the work that's already being done is the hope. Um, and there, and there, are, there are all sorts of things that, are, that, are, that have been developing you know, over the past year since the ship has been found. Um, you know, there's an, there are environmental groups, there is the, the Descendants Association, and now there is an umbrella group that's formed to sort of help funnel resources and energy and money because the world is going to be watching, you know, when, especially when this film comes out. So, and, and there are steps underway to bring the ship up. You know, they are going to excavate the ship. So I think in, in the movie, you know, they touch on EJI and the sort of economic potential of 
uh, tourism. And I think there, there, that is an opportunity for Africatown as well to tether the future to the history and harness that and create revenue that flows directly into, mm -hmm. there's a model for that that exists, you know? So and it's up in Birmingham, it's not even that far away. It's very easy to replicate that. And I think it's, it, it's just a matter of time. You know, the boat will come up out of the river. There will be this unprecedented artifact. And I think it's just about harnessing the work that everybody's doing to kind of find some money to sort of support all these efforts. Mm -hmm seems to make great good sense. And, and there, is a, there is a land trust that, that, yeah. that is being explored um, to, to potentially take back control of some of this, this all the vacant land that, that you see. So yeah, those are... Yes. Yeah, but I, I, I mean, I think the question is for, for y'all in the Martha's Vineyard community, right? If you touched by the film, how are you going to join to be a cohort with us who are down there doing the fight? You know, how can you how can you pitch in and what impact can you have as viewer? I mean, all these wonderful black narratives out there, but it's like Anderson said in the film, what are you gonna do when you leave? Well, hopefully what you do when you leave is be like, mm, you know, Joycelyn is starting a griot storytelling association with the children. I need to support her. You know, Emmett is gonna start his he has started his own barbershop and finished business school. I need to support him. You know, Kern got that thing out to the University of South Alabama where he's taking his students to Benin. We need to support him so that we can create little soldiers coming up to, to do what we're doing. Because the issue now is sustainability. When them folks, you know, Lorna Woods and them go, you know, it's only a couple of them that are the master storytellers, right? And one person you didn't mention is between Zora Hurston and Vita and, and Joycelyn, here is, is Albert Murray. You know, the jazz at Lincoln Center, Absolutely. man. Absolutely. He's from Plateau. He's from Africatown. I didn't know that. Yeah. He went, he went, he's from Africatown. He went up to Tuskegee, and he's Ralph Ellison's good friend, and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, James right. Baldwin, a lot yeah. of... So, you know, who's going to be the master storytellers coming up? And are you creating master storytellers? You know, that's the beauty of Margaret, being the director on here. She, she gave us some space. Everybody got to talk. Everybody got to talk. Absolutely. And that's probably a good point at which to leave us for tonight. Everybody got to talk, <laughs> but... I think that if there are ways that people can contribute and address and hold hands with and walk alongside, uh, let us know. And Descendantfilm.com. I don't think it's descendantfilm.com. I don't think it's live just yet. But, but it's it will coming. Be. Yes. Okay. And it will direct folks. It'll direct folks. Good. Yeah. Uh, I know that you're about to have a life that you cannot imagine. Um, <laughs> trust me. Um, I want to end with a quote from one of my favorite people in the world, little Steve Lund Morris, and who said. You better tell your story well, because if you lie, it will come to pass. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you, Essie. Thank you, everybody. Kyle, Dr. Jackson, Vita, and Joycelyn, thank you for telling our story well. Thank you. <laughs>